Deidre Kress, the Managing Editor of Conservation Letters, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Peter Mumby, who is the lead author of the feature article for the May-June issue entitled Operationalizing the Resilience of Coral Reefs in an Era of Climate Change. Peter, welcome. Thank you. So before we get started here, um, could you give us a little bit of information about the ecology of the Belize Barrier Reef in the context of conservation planning and ecosystem management? Sure. The Belize Barrier Reef is the second largest reef system in the Caribbean. And it's of you know, vast importance for the country in terms of tourism and people's livelihoods through fisheries. When I started working there in 1991, um, most of the fishery was focused on species like snapper and grouper that are highly desirable. And parrotfish was not even considered. I mean, if you ask someone, do you fish parrotfish, they'll just laugh at you and think you're crazy. But the grouper and snapper populations declined over time as they increasingly fished them. And by 2004, parrotfish had become the number one species at the sort of bottom of the food chain that was being harvested. And this was a real concern because you know, parrotfish play a very important role grazing down seaweeds and helping corals recover. Um, corals and seaweeds sort of compete with one another. And um, so there was growing concerns about the resilience of the reef and that the average health of the reef was declining and to what extent could management help uh, change that trajectory. And so our plan was to say, can we understand the resilience of the barrier reef? Um, and can we do two things? Can we, first of all, ask the question, are there certain parts of the reef where the implementation of a protected area that would actually protect parrotfish through no fishing would have a, a big impact on the future resilience of those reefs? Because in some places you might have a relatively weak impact. And the second question was, well, if given that the Belize government in fact introduced a policy in 2009 to completely outlaw the fishing of herbivores, including parrotfish, what effect has that had, or do we expect that to have had, on the resilience of the barrier reef system? And so we're asking these questions about the impact of the policy, and then also by identifying areas of um, protected areas that might actually have a big impact on resilience those results are currently feeding into a new program that's going on in Belize right now to extend the protected areas. So although there's actually a complete ban on parrotfish harvesting, um, at least the enforcement of that ban will be greatest most likely in areas that are already declared and managed as protected areas. So are there certain locations that perhaps should be prioritized? And you've been in Belize studying or studying uh, the, uh, this research in Belize since 1991? That's correct. Yeah, my, the first time I ever saw a coral reef was in Belize and I went on an expedition there and fell in love with it right there and then. And so, um, you know, it's been a, um, you know, a bit of a sobering experience seeing the decline in the health of reefs mm -hmm. that I used to know so well, even within that relatively short um, time period. And uh, so anything that we can do to sort of help manage those reefs is, is, you know, is, is a bonus. And when I was there in the early 90s, I was um, trying to assist the fisheries department in designing marine protected areas. And we helped develop a management plan for um, one area that I know very, very well. And uh, at the time of doing that, it was really clear that there was relatively little science available to guide our decision making. And, um, and so and that's really what's motivated a lot of this research that's led up to this current paper. And so you've been looking at both what can be done locally as well as nationally and inter internationally. And so uh, we'll talk, we'll get into this a little bit later, but um, one of the questions that I had was, can the work that you've done here sort of be extrapolated uh, for coral reefs, you know, everywhere? Okay, so um, Belize is in the Caribbean and Caribbean reefs are really very different to reefs in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. In fact, Caribbean reefs have the lowest resilience of almost any coral reef uh, region of the planet. Um, and we're not entirely sure why. I mean, there's a, there's a, a bunch of factors. One is that um, seaweeds or algae on Caribbean reefs have a proclivity to bloom very easily. I um, mean, if you reduce the amount of, of herbivores that are trying to graze it down, or if you uh, potentially add nutrients, the response by the algae is, is very rapid. Um, 
in other parts of the world, the algae don't bloom quite so easily. And, and that bloom of algae is a problem for coral because um, the algae take up space that the corals would otherwise try and um, settle on and, and colonize and grow. And the algae can smother living corals, so they can actually reduce the rate at which corals are able to recover after a disturbance. Um, and then when they are trying to recover, the growth rates of individual corals decline and the fecundity declines when they're sort of battling away with seaweeds. So the Caribbean seems to have a sort of seaweed problem. Hmm. And, um, and that was really became obvious in 1984 when the long-spined sea urchin, which was abundant throughout most of the Caribbean, died out because of a disease. And right around the Caribbean, within one year, um, that really important herbivorous sea urchin almost became extinct. And, um, and as a result, that all of this sort of control of seaweeds by herbivores was, rather than it being a job for fish and sea urchins, it became just a, a fish job. And the fish um, you know, have got a limit to how much they can can cope with. So in general, when you go and look at reefs in the Caribbean, you will see more seaweed than in many other parts of the world. Okay. Um, so I think the results can be extrapolated within much of the Caribbean. Um, it's all pretty much all the same species, the same processes going on around the region, um, but you can't directly extrapolate the results to places like the Great Barrier Reef, for example. Sure. So now hurricanes is something that you talk about in the context of, of the article. And, you know, there's been a lot of natural disasters and tsunamis and hurricanes. And so uh, talk to us a little bit about kind of the recovery flexibility of the reefs in this kind of an acute disturbance. Yeah, I mean, you know, hurricanes have been a part of coral reef dynamics f forever. And um, so you know, hurricanes by themselves aren't a source of, 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 of concern. However, because the recovery potential of reefs has declined for a variety of factors, principally because now it's so much easier for seaweeds to, to bloom because they're not controlled so well. Now what happens is that a hurricane that would normally have hit a reef, killed coral, broken it up, that would have been followed by a period of rapid recovery of the corals and that wouldn't have been a long-term problem. But now because the recovery is so uh, slow and in many cases doesn't even seem to occur very well. Um, even a natural process like a hurricane will sort of, if you like, ratchet down the health of the reef. The first hurricane comes along and reef health declines a bit. It tries to recover a little bit and then bang, it gets hit again. Mm -hmm. So all this stuff pushes the system down. And so when you take these acute disturbances and the other major acute disturbance that we're facing these days is coral bleaching. Um, putting all these things together and we see that there's a sort of real trajectory downwards of many Caribbean reefs, again, which raises concerns about their resilience. Now, you talked a little bit about the parrot fish. So they're playing a role or a, a, it seems like a modest role in bioerosion. So talk a little bit more, if you could, about their relationship to the coral reefs and some of your modeling efforts. Yeah, so you know, parrot fish do have, I mean, they're herbivorous, they eat seaweed. Um, some species of parrotfish, and not all, but some, also take a small proportion of their bites from live coral. Um, and also, some of those species, when they're taking a bite from the reef, I mean, they have these hard beaks, and as they scrape algae from the surface of the coral, they often include a little bit of that coral skeleton, gets bitten off as well, and that's actually loaded with all sorts of little algae inside it, which is perfectly natural. So, they, they really achieve two things. One is that they're scraping the reef free of algae, which is a good thing, but they're also a natural source of erosion because every time they bite, at least for some of the species, they take a small sliver of reef with them. Mm -hmm. And so the concern that we and many other people have is that um, if you end up with uh, too much erosion, and parrotfish are by no means the most important source of erosion. I mean, there's um, sponges that grow on corals and sort of essentially dissolve away the skeleton and urchins also dissolve or rather erode away the skeleton mm -hmm. that you could actually end up with too much erosion and the whole reef starts to sort of begin to collapse um, now no one's ever implicated parrotfish as uh, creating so much erosion that they're effectively um, removing the entire skeleton um, and most of 
of the studies that have been done, the modeling studies, where we take the measured impact of parrotfish as a source of erosion. And we also consider, of course, their role at scraping algae free. Because they're scraping algae free, they're facilitating corals colonizing the reef and growing relatively free of algae. So that's a positive thing on the reef. And they're, they're sort of taking away a little bit, but they're facilitating the coral, which is building the reef. And in every experiment we've ever done, we find that the positive role of parrotfish in helping corals grow outweighs their, if you like, negative role of sure. removing substrate. So they're a net benefit to the reef. Um, okay. It's very important. So in terms of the algae, you, you use the term in the, in the paper, algal competition. Mm. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah. So... Um, Seaweeds, I mean, there's a whole variety of different seaweeds on a reef, of course, but when we talk about seaweeds, we're really talking about um, some of the very conspicuous, often brown seaweeds. I mean, one group called Dictyota is really fleshy, it looks like a big sort of fuzzy mess. And there's others called Lobotha, which is more of a sort of carpeting alga. Um, and, and these seaweeds, um, the first thing that they do is that they take up space and it's very hard for a new coral larva when it's coming to a reef and it's trying to settle and generate a new coral. It's hard for them to find a place that's free of algae to get established. Once they do get established, uh, as they start to grow, the algae can affect them in a number of ways. I mean, they can reduce the amount of light, which slows down the coral growth rate. Um, they can uh, touch the coral and then the coral spends a lot of energy trying to fight off the alga, and because it's spending so much energy doing that, it doesn't grow very quickly. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem because when a coral is very, very small, it's extremely vulnerable to all sorts of disturbance. It could be getting rolled around, it could be um, getting sort of bitten off by something as it's feeding on the reef. And the bigger the coral is, the, the sort of greater its, its likelihood for survival. And so by the corals having these battles and competing with algae, it keeps them smaller and more vulnerable for longer. And even the larger corals um, suffer when they're in contact with algae. We've got evidence to show that their fecundity declines and they produce smaller eggs when they're in contact with corals, with, with algae. So algae have these variety of ways in which they interact and there's been a whole bunch of exciting research uh, by others looking at the mechanisms and the sort of chemical mechanisms by which these uh, plants and corals interact. But it, it's pretty clear that there's this competition going on, and that can slow coral recovery. Sure, it sounds like it. So in our final couple of minutes here, um, I wanted to have you touch on the concept of unstable equilibrium, and then sort of give us the key takeaways and summary points, uh, so we have kind of a general sense of what sure. readers can expect in this article. Yeah, so we really focus on resilience. Resilience is an ecological concept um, that's, uh, I guess it's now, 40 years old, it was originally developed by Buzz Holland. And for coral reefs in the Caribbean at least, what we know, or what we think we know, is that um, under certain conditions, in a, in a, for recovery to take place, the recruitment of new corals and their growth has to be greater than the background rate of mortality. Okay, so you might have a disturbance, but then the corals can start to recover. But there are certain conditions where the recovery of corals and the recruitment and growth is so slow, maybe because of seaweed, that it's no longer able to sort of replace corals as they die naturally. And when that happens, you essentially cannot sustain the population and the coral cover starts to spiral downwards. Um, and the unstable equilibria are simply a set of, if you like, thresholds that sort of indicate the conditions, which might be the amount of coral that's on the reef today, type of environment that they're in and the amount of herbivorous fish, the amount of nutrients and so forth. It sort of defines whether or not the reef is likely to have enough natural capacity for recovery to replenish the population and recover over time. So by identifying where these areas are, we can ask the question, how likely is it that a reef of this state today it may have, let's say, 25% living coral? And what environment it's in. It might be in an environment where algae grow very slowly or where algae grow very quickly. And with a particular kind of disturbance environment. So some areas might have more frequent hurricanes than others or more likely to accept, uh, experience bleaching. But putting all of that together and modelling it, we can ask the question, how likely are these reefs 
at the end of some period of time of interest, and we've chosen the next 20 years, so up to 2030, how likely are reefs at that location to still have an ability to show recovery by 2030, given the fact that they have all these impacts um, and, and everything else? And then we ask the question, um, if you were to put in a marine protected area at that site and allow the parrotfish to recover, then um, how would that influence that sort of potential for recovery, which is the resilience? The resilience is the probability that reefs can show that kind of recovery by 2030. So, and um, we've mapped that throughout Belize by taking a whole series of, of real data sets. We've modelled the hurricanes, we've modelled the climate change impacts, and we've then uh, shown essentially that without any coral reef management, any new coral reef management, only a small proportion of reefs were actually predicted to be resilient by 2030. When Belize introduced this complete ban on parrotfish fishing, that increased the resilience sixfold, so that about more than half of the reefs are still expected to show recovery um, by 2030. Um, and this was a you know, useful outcome because it really helps to verify that that policy decision appears to be borne out in terms of the potential resilience of the ecosystem. We also identify those areas where um, the ability of protecting parrotfish to affect resilience is greater than others, and those are areas that might be prioritised, in fact are being prioritised for conservation. And then the last thing we consider is how does this differ in, in terms of the action that humanity take in reducing greenhouse gas emissions? And what we find is that if there's no action to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, in other words, we continue on our current trajectory, then um, you know, the, the outlook is, of course, fairly bleak. Um, and in fact, that even if you were to protect parrotfish, there is a benefit, but it's a sort of modest benefit. But if we take really assertive action on climate change and we follow some of the more ambitious and optimistic scenarios that have been considered by the IPCC, then the impact of that local management is a lot greater. In fact, it's about three times greater. And so, you know, it's not very surprising perhaps, but the more we can do to sort of arrest the climate change problems, the more likely our local management is to deliver a good outcome. But it's important to bear in mind that even with the current climate change scenarios, um, local management is really important at helping corals to maintain resilience. It can have a big impact on resilience and help coral populations turn over. It, it doesn't mean we're going to be facing beautiful reefs in the future, but it does mean that if they have enough resilience, even if the amount of coral is generally not that great, the coral populations are still, you know, reproducing, recruiting, growing, maybe dying, and that turnover keeps things open for adaptation and devolution, and that's going to be critical. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the important considerations, even if we have reefs that aren't as pretty as they were when and many people, including myself, started diving. Mm -hmm. Well, it's important research. I'm glad we had the opportunity to speak with you, and thank you so much for this contribution to Conservation Letters. Thank you. Take care.